Olá, fellows. Olá, meus irmãos africanos. <laughs> Hello, African leaders. It's almost time to say goodbye. Yeah. Uh, we are now on the last point of our agenda. And I'm sure as me, you all can feel the energy, a lot of energy, collaboration, sharing. It's been intensive days, yeah? But it's now time to reflect about our responsibility and make sure we achieve the sustainable development goals. And to drive us on this reflection, I will have the pleasure to to invite to the station Geraldine Frazing Moleke, Mo, Moleketi, sorry. <laughs> As a special envoy on gender at Africa Development Bank, Geraldine leads a strategy to mainstream gender in the bank's policies and operations. She was previ previ previously director of the United Nations Development Program, Democracy Governance Group. She served as Minister of Public Service Administration for two consecutive terms and was a Minister of Welfare and Population Development in South Africa First Democratic government, gov government. Geraldine served as parliamentarian and member of the Constituent Assembly responsible for, for drawing up the Southern Africa Constitution adopted in 1996. She is a fellow of the Institute of of politics, Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, and has completed a leadership course at Wharton Business School at University of Pennsylvania. Geraldine holds a master's degree in administration and has received several awards, including the OP Dewey Vedi Public Service Award for the International Association of Schools and Institute Public Administration, and a special award for outstanding achievement from the University of Pretorian School of Public Management and Administration. Most recently, she was named the 2016 New African Woman of the Year. <laughs> A strong supporter of international dialogue, Geraldine mentors young women and men across continent and leadership and resili res resilience. I would like to ask you to pay attention on her, on these closing remarks, that we actually expect to not to be a closing or ending moment, but instead a beginning or continuity of a journey that leads us to our goals. Fellows, please join me to welcome Geraldine. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. I think it's quite special for me to be here. I'd like to thank you all. It's quite an honor to join you today. I'm going to be a bit irreverent for a minute and say one thing. You've just seen that uh, you don't need to be tall to achieve anything. <laughs> you also don't need to be short to achieve anything, you know? so wanted to, to just uh, make that point uh, up front. So, great to be here. I think it's without fear of contradiction that I would argue that some of Africa's best and brightest is in this room. And I'd like to give a round of applause to all of you who are here today. As uh, was reflected in some of the comments about uh, who I am, I come at this point in time from the African Development Bank. But I've also had uh, the singular honor of having worked with some of Africa's greatest leaders. And I think it's something that we cannot take for granted. As was pointed out, I, amongst others, had served in the first democratic government of our country, South Africa. 
um, in Nelson Mandela's government and cabinet. But I think above all, what I consider one of the big uh, pearls of my own journey is that I had the privilege as well of having lived in various African countries. I spent some of my exile years in Zimbabwe, in Angola, in Zambia, and Mozambique, Lesotho, Swaziland, and many of the other countries were also those that were very close and part of the building of this democracy. Tanzania has always held a special place in our heart. And this is because Tanzania has been one of those countries where we had a great leader in Mwalimu Julius Nyerere. So why do I raise this as I'm to challenge you about the sustainable development goals? Why do I raise it as you are this special group coming together and looking at what you are going to contribute and work on in the attainment of the goals? Because after all, the sustainable development goals is a very short lifespan to achieve. 15 years. And when we look at what we want to attain in 2025, it's very clear that it's not the kind of thing you can do when you go and watch the UEFA Cup games, whether it's on television or otherwise, or when you watch the Africa Cup games. It's something that requires the involvement of each and every one. And you will have to be dynamos in communities that you are from. And whether your community is a local community or whether your community is the public sector or your community can be the private sector or whether it's a role at, at more of a leadership level in a country, you've got to look at how you're going to make that change be. So let me come back and just conclude about the point I raised about the privilege of having lived and worked in different African countries. As Special Envoy on Gender of the African Development Bank, I've also had the ability to travel across various African countries and more recently it has been in Mali and in Guinea-Bissau. And in going into those countries, it is very clear that the, millennia, uh, the Millennium Development Goals were not fully achieved. And here, we're pushing today, and we are determined to make a difference to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, with a room like this, I'm not going to go through the goals. You know them quite well. You've had a very interesting panel that earlier in the week had spoken about you creating a table and ensuring that that table uh, could potentially challenge the other table or not. Now, I want to take that figure further. It's not just about creating a table, but it's also ensuring that you have a seat at the table. And remember, nobody invites you to take a seat necessarily. Nobody necessarily invites you. But you need to claim that space and claim that seat. As men, as women, as young people, as marginalized groups, you claim the seat. And also contribute towards shaping the agenda. Because if you're going to expect a framework, clear terms of reference, an outline, and everybody will clearly tell you what uh, uh, the roadmap is going to be, well, then I don't think that you should be in this group. And then I don't think that you are young Africans who have the thirst to make a difference. And it's probably wrong to use thirst right now when there's drought in about 
Well, it's actually right to use thirst with drought in a number of Southern African countries because at the end of the day, we need to see it, how we deal with that. So look at how you're going to be able to shape what's required to make a difference. Coming back to a special envoy role. So I came into the African Development Bank three years ago, and again, I'm sure you're going to ask me now, what on earth has that got to do with the SG, SDGs? But wait for it, hopefully it will come. Coming into the ADB three years ago in, on the 1st of September this year, before I entered, I was told um, the ADB needs to reshape the way in which it has dealt with de gender, equality, and women's empowerment on, uh, during, uh, in the 14 years up to that point and felt that they wanted me to assist in contributing with that. And before going there, I, I actually raised with the then incumbent president, Dr. Donald Kabaruka. I said to him, um, I'm not sure, so sure why you're looking at me to do this. Because in terms of my background and in terms of my academic and professional uh, background, I would not consider myself to be a gender specialist, but I consider myself to be an activist, a gender activist, a women's activist, somebody who was part of the struggle for democracy in South Africa at an age that was actually younger than most of you here, and through a period that was your age, I, I was 35 when I was appointed to cabinet in South Africa under Nelson Mandela, so anything is possible. And I said, look, um, so I'm not quite the one to do that. But I said, above all, coming into an institution that is essentially a, a multilateral development institution, um, how is it going to be possible to retain the triple A rating of this institution and bring in place a transformation agenda such as ensuring that gender equality and women's economic empowerment is part of the DNA of the institution. I then thought that I should do what you see on this television program on how to become a millionaire or something. You know, you have three options. The one is to phone a friend. So I thought, uh, let me phone a friend who's in the financial sector. And I contacted Maria Ramos, whom I had worked with in different capacities. As some of you may be aware, Maria is the CEO of uh, APSA Barclays at this point in time. She was also Director General of uh, the South African Treasury and clearly was someone who was in areas in the financial sector um, that are not easy areas. And I said, listen, Maria, I'd like to have a chat with you about this. And she said to me, she said, you know, Geraldine, it's going to be quite difficult because the financial sector is one that, as we all know, can be quite fixed in its approaches and ways of doing things, but above all, is quite patriarchal. You just need to look around board tables, look at management of banks, etc., and you see it's predominantly male. And she said there were even moments when I would feel a little bit intimidated. And I mean, Maria Ramos, very few can intimidate her. So bear that in mind and be very clear what the few things are that you'd want to achieve. And I thought, right on. I have done difficult things in my life, but it's very clear the most difficult is yet to come. And I'd want to say, fast forward, and now nearly three years down the line, 
that the African Development Bank is mainstreaming gender across every operation in the bank. The African Development Bank is looking at changing the DNA of the bank. The African Development Bank is very clear that in its role to transform the African economy, it cannot leave half of the human capital of this continent behind. So I raise this and I take it to the SDGs. So you could look at the SDGs and say, this is a huge challenge, how do I do it? And you could do it in your sector, in your area, but unless you are cross-cutting in your approach to take it forward, and unless you're willing to be bold and audacious in what you do, it will not happen. But above all, remember, it's not one SDG at a time. It's got to be cross-cutting. And it's not about one sector at a time. It's got to be cross-cutting across sectors as you engage with dealing with the sustainable development goals. But above all, it's also how do you bring communities and ensure their involvement? How do you get government involved to play its role? How do you ensure that the private sector plays a role? And then above all, find the finances to achieve it. You need human capital, so the people, you need the resources, and you need to know where to find it. And even if the resources is not available immediately, you ensure that you find the resources to make it happen. And look at the resources immediately around you and the resources that are available to you. So again, why am I flying at 300,000 feet when maybe you want me just to come down to the specific community? It's look at your macro environment, see what's there, what's the potential, and then bring it down to the micro. And ensure that you leave no one behind as you take that forward. On the resources, the multilateral development banks at the Financing for Development Summit last year, FFD3 in um, Addis had said, they would contribute from, millions, uh, from billions to trillions. They went further to commit that there's also a need to look at innovative financing. Hold them honest, keep their feet to the fire, go back and say, let's just hear how you're unpacking that. Because it's one thing making the global commitments. It's a very different thing to see the change on the ground. The second point is all governments in New York last year reflected their commitment to the SDGs. And I think there's also a need as you go back to your respective countries to also say, where is that forum that brings government, private sector, and civil society together, not just to meet for the sake of meeting, but to actually ensure that the national plans are on track that feeds into sub-regional and regional plans, the larger Africa agenda and a global agenda. But I think the fourth and almost most important issue is how do you change those plans, the blueprint on the SDGs, the fact that they are measurable indicators, because after all, we treasure what we measure. If you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. Don't come and tell us simply anecdotally what it is about, so, or what it should be. But I think looking at all this, we also say to ourselves, so how do we achieve it? And this is where you call yourselves the Yalis, no? Or is the Yalis the others? The older ones? I mean, the, I don't know what, okay, let me not get into this. It may be hallowed ground that I shouldn't go into. But anyway, um, the Washington Mandela Fellows, Mandela Fellows, 
it's for you to actually say, what contribution can I make to make a difference? And how am I going to almost unlock the ideas, the policies, the blueprints into practical action? Because what we know is a global malaise, it's an African malaise, and a sub-regional malaise is we good on the policies, we fabulous on the blueprints, but actually walking, not only the talk, but the actual path is not that, e not that easily done. And I think I put out the challenge to you guys as I talk about being audacious and the audacity of audaciousness, I put out the challenge and say, you ensure that you unlock and make the implementation happen. Because if you come back in 2015 and you sit before the then class of 2025 and you tell them, we had intended However, the subjective and objective conditions were such that we could not attain it. I would wish that they boo you out of the room. <laughs> that would be my wish. They would simply let... Uh, and uh, so for you, it's to actually say what can and should be done to transform a global blueprint, a global contract into reality. And remember that this global contract was not done by a few in a corner. It came through a process. And the process was almost Im as important as the SDGs and the indicators that go with it. But I think what is going to be more fundamental is how you make a difference and how you would want to be seen in 2025. And remember, you do this not for yourself, but you do it for the beautiful ones who are yet to be born. You do it for the girls and boys on this African continent who do not have the privilege to be in this room and part of your community. You do it for the men and women and the youth of Africa who at times are seen to be the demographic burden or curse rather than the demographic dividend. And we need to ensure that we make the SDGs and 2025 a year that we contribute towards reaping the harvest of the demographic dividend of the youth of the African continent. And just as was said earlier, whoever the next US president is, she will definitely support this program. <laughs> We'd also want to ensure that the program has wings going forward with that relationship. But we would want our, uh, to hold our leaders to account because we'd want to have leaders at all levels, at all levels, continental, country, political, civil society, business, and in all sectors that are ready to walk the walk. Thank you very much, everyone. Much. Now, please welcome US, I, USAID's Acting Deputy Assistant Administrator of the Bureau for Africa, Christopher Runyon, to the podium. All right, guys, you almost made it. Uh, I thought I would give a few remarks. This will only take about two or three hours. <laughs> oh, you are paying attention. Hey, guys. All right, so uh, 
thank you to our last speaker for a fabulous presentation. Thank you for the motivation and for the focus on the future. Uh, it's absolutely fabulous uh, to see so many of the 2015 fellows. Again, I saw many of you in Washington, but not everyone. Uh, and it's been great to connect and reconnect with you this week. Um, sometimes uh, a little too late and in the bar. <laughs> There's probably some interesting security camera footage of the entrance of the hotel uh, over the last couple of nights. Uh, we will be reviewing that very closely. <laughs> Yes, this could be reflected in the Names and Faces app. <laughs> uh, all right, so I said this last year, uh, and I'll say it again this year, but I think I've never been so happy to spend a week at a hotel attached to an airport before. Uh, uh, and it's because of you all. Uh, so thank you so much. You came from all over Southern Africa to be here, and we know this comes at a price uh, in your time. You have organizations to run, you have policies to implement, you have youth in your communities to mentor, uh, you have funds to raise for your next project. Uh, uh, thanks for putting your energy and dynamism into the agenda, into the discussion, into the feedback. Please fill out your forms. Uh, as we look to uh, improve this event uh, for future classes of fellows. Uh, it's clear that you're switched on, engaged, listening, talking, seizing the moment. Uh, many of our external guests this week told me how powerful this event was for them, and that's, of course, through you. Some extraordinary things happened this week that we will read about later, I am sure, uh, in newspapers, on TV, in social media, in other places. And that's also true about the people. Uh, Puti, I think, nicely captured this on Thursday. Uh, you can never assume you know someone based on where they are today when you don't know what they will be tomorrow. So, I think we can agree that when you are all together, there is a certain magic, a certain spark that happens. As ideas are shared, cross-border friendships are created, and new business or civic partnerships are built. I think I just watched one happen about an hour ago between Mauritius and Lesotho, uh, which was pretty cool. Um, it's so apparent how amazing you are when that connection happens, and I'm so proud and glad that we were able to facilitate in-person meetings like this, as well as, as you heard from my colleagues, opportunities online for you to keep the conversation and the connections going. As you know, in addition to celebrating many Yali Fellow successes, we've also talked about some difficult issues and long-term challenges as you seek to make change and prosperity in Southern Africa and Africa as a whole. I'm glad we had those tough conversations. Uh, if not, what's the point of getting together? Uh, the problems aren't easy, so why would the conversations be easy? You don't have to agree with everything each person says, and I'm proud that we have these differences and that these discussions happen the Yali way. Respectful, direct, focused on solutions, and unedited. We've also talked about solutions, and we've shared ideas, and we've been inspired by experts who have joined us, and now we have a lot of work to do. So it's been an exciting year for sure, but as much as there has been excitement during your time with Yali, with new ventures, new ideas, new friends, new travels, I know there have been some difficult times as well. And what I mean by that for difficult times uh, is, yes, the broad challenges we face in tackling sustainable development, as you chose for your theme here. I also mean the difficult times any individual faces when charging out to do something new, moreover something new that requires a commitment to a huge, massive goal. Courageous goals often sound great at first, and it's very exciting, right? Uh, the Twitters are telling me that for sure. Uh, I'm going to solve extreme poverty in my community. I'm going to create a social venture that eliminates uh, trash and creates jobs. Uh, I'm also sure uh, over the last year, in addition to the excitement about your goals and your objectives, you've also faced those messy in the trenches moments where you've thought, why did I decide to do this? Why did I convince myself I would be the one who would act on this big problem? Uh, and those are the moments when staying the course is so important. Um, as I was saying, I saw a lot of the Twitter feed uh, and uh, don't give up, never give up was certainly one of the things that showed up a few times uh, phrased in different ways. It's also a time to reach out to your peers when you have these little, little crises, lowercase, small font crises. Uh, 
And that's why that web of support that you all have created for yourselves with YALI is so important. Uh, those moments when it looks like the goal you set out to meet cannot be reached, maybe don't just adjust the goal, maybe don't adjust the goal at all. Uh, maybe adjust the action steps. Uh, it often takes the perspectives of others to help us unlock the choices and the alternative options that we have that we're not thinking about. Uh, I can't an imagine how many times I was on the verge of making terrifically bad decisions and checked with somebody else to just help me figure out if I was viewing this the right way. I encourage you to do the same. Be open to them, reach out to those in this room, in other regions, and I would particularly love to inspire you to do more connections with a lot of your YALI peers uh, and members of the YALI network and members of the regional leadership centers from other areas outside of Southern Africa. One of the big goals we'd love for this program to have is that continent-wide impact. And it's part of the beauty of, of course, that, that when you went to your institutes in the US, you were with people from a variety of different regions within Africa. So speaking of inspiration, uh, I'm still feeling inspired by some of the shout outs that we've heard from people uh, throughout the week. And I want to particularly point out again this mention of some fantastic folks who are coming through the regional leadership centers. Uh, I was able to attend the graduation last night and, and they're just amazing. So they are of the same DNA as you, trust me. I encourage you to keep up with them, uh, particularly with the RLC in Southern Africa. We are happy to help facilitate some of those connections. Uh, if you're coming through town here, I'm sure the RLC would love to have you as a guest speaker. And if you're not coming through town here, I'm sure the RLC would love to have you as a guest speaker. Uh, we have the technology people, it's not that difficult. Uh, so let's take advantage of it. Um, and uh, yeah, I should also point this out too, on the alumni connections, uh, where's my Botswana crowd? Yeah. We only have one person here from Botswana? Uh-huh. Right. Well, I know that they've done some amazing work to connect alumni, both the fellows and graduates of the Regional Leadership Center. So I encourage you to broaden your groups at home uh, beyond just uh, those uh, fellow fellows. So, okay. Uh, please continue to share your stories. You've already heard this 12 times. I'm going to do it one more time. Uh, we need that. And, and uh, the panel uh, talked about that a little bit, but I'll tell you another reason, and I'll tell you another reason why I need it now. Uh, as we go into the transition of administrations, we really need to make this case to our Congress. And I'll be meeting with a lot of members uh, and staff over this summer, and we'll be bringing some of the 2016 fellows uh, to Congress to meet them, just like we did with a group last year. Uh, but you guys have had more time on the ground since you got home. And if I can tell stories of your impact and put that to them to say why, value, why this program is so valuable, keep it going. Help us out. Make sure the check shows up in the mail. That would be very, very powerful. So please give us stuff. Push it along. So uh, now a few important words of thanks uh, to IREX, to the volunteers who helped make this all happen, the speakers, the staff, of the hotel, thanks to them for, for the tireless efforts. Uh, uh, I can tell you uh, it is a massive amount of hours that goes into making all of this happen. Uh, m much effort that you guys don't see and everything usually works pretty well. Uh, and I understand this one has worked very well, so thanks to all of them. I also want to thank the private sector partners uh, who have been so helpful in our work and many organizations and companies, many of whom joined the expo yesterday, but many of whom you'll probably have great chances to connect with going forward in the future as we build our network. And I'd also like to thank, uh, uh, we I think still have a handful of some of the volunteer mentors uh, that we have here who have offered to help fellows from Southern Africa as they apply the YALI experience to their professional work, so thanks to them especially as well. Um, our partners and mentors uh, have given their time and expertise to the fellows to meet their goals, but have also learned immensely from these talented fellows. I was hearing another story yesterday about, um, I think it was one of the executive coaches, who said, geez, these guys are awesome. I don't need to get paid for this. Let's just keep coaching until 
you want to not coach anymore. So they've created lifelong relationships with some of these people, and I think that's incredibly valuable going forward. So do take advantage of that. Um, one other special and incredibly important thanks to give is for the RAB. So I want to recognize each and every member of the board who has given their time and energy to ensure we've had these productive discussions uh, uh, at the conference. Uh, the RAB's been brilliant and worked very closely with our team uh, to put on this event here. Uh, the board's done an excellent and exceptional job representing the region. Uh, as you know, we look very hard at trying to make sure that the RAB reflects you the best we can with 10 people, which is not easy to do. Uh, and thanks for all of those who helped participate in both helping to encourage a friend of yours to nominate themselves to be a RAB member and then also participating in the voting process to help put them in positions of leadership. So they're a great bridge for us. Uh, they're a huge interpreter for us on, on where we can take this program and also, of course, most importantly, on how we can refine it and make it better and make sure it meets the demands of our customers. That's you. So board members, please come up to the stage now uh, together, and as I call your name, receive a small token of our appreciation. So LePang Ferguson. Annabella Marcos. Ah, yay, there you are. Great. Rick Ernest Bagnier. Yeah, there he is. Contile Cunene. We did a graduation ceremony at the RLC last night. It was like, what, 130? So I've sort of got my choreography now pretty well with the significance. Thank you. All right, promise, Moulier. Tamarilson. Where is he? Where is he? There he is. Chisanga Mwamba. Tato Machone. <laughs> okay. All right, Salim Ismail. And not, but, not, but, but certainly not least, Christopher Vuba, our chair. <laughs> you want to say a few words? Uh, sure. We're gonna we're go we're going off script. Christopher has <laughs> stolen the mic. I guess as the chair, does he have that right? Yeah. Uh. I actually want to drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to have, have two sentiments to share. Um, <clears throat> on your way out, whoever you see, the volunteers who have dedicated their time in that spirit, volunteers, the mentors that have volunteered their time with some of the fellows and offered coaching and really. Um, 
good career path, growth, and advice. And then most importantly, to each and every one of you, I know people are businessmen, they're entrepreneurs, they are people running organizations, and uh, time is really money. So, um, I mean, my boss is ready to fire me, probably. Um, <laughs> so I just want to thank you for bringing yourself, for bringing the energy, and really making this conference a success. Thank you. Oh, and thank you to Chris for keeping this going. Hey. It's really good. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> fellows, I'll close with a simple message. Uh, be genuine. Be engaged. Be connected with each other, with the 2014 fellows, the 16 fellows, the Regional Leadership Center participants, the YALI Network. There's so much knowledge, energy, and expertise you can access. Remember that your success is great, but that you are part of a virtuous cycle. You, with your peers, with your friends, with others. Uh, you're not just fellows, but you're a fellowship. Uh, work together to promote peace, good governance, inclusive development, and regional collaboration. And as uh, Dr. Moyo said, uh, and as we heard earlier, uh, make your own table. Hopefully your table won't be broken. <laughs> uh, where's Andrew? From Malawi. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, I was thinking about this. M maybe, uh, maybe we should hire some carpenters for Yali <laughs> just to have them in case. <laughs> we have some table reconstruction to do. So uh, thank you, everybody. Our regional conference is officially concluded, uh, but our journey together begins again.